Hi, my fifth grade friends. It's Mrs. Real here with a chapter book for you for the next couple of weeks. Um, I like using this book with fifth graders um, at this time of year because of the science kit that you're supposed to be doing, but we're not at school doing science kits. So I am working on getting some of the science kit information so we can do a little bit of read aloud, a little bit of science. Um, and if we don't ever get to the science part, then we still have a really cool book. So the book I have for you today, I know you're fifth graders, but it's Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. You guys have lived through fourth grade, you've experienced it all, so you know what might be the feelings that might be happening in the story. And it's just a really funny story. Judy Bloom is a great author. She has some really funny stories. She has some bigger stories. She writes stories for grown-ups too. So she's a really fun author to know. The Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. So I'm going to start today and I'm going to read for a few chapters. In fact, I better get my phone, set a timer so I know I'm not reading forever because I could, you know. Um, so I'll read 15 or 20 minutes of it today. We'll stop there. Then I'll do a couple more lessons and we'll finish it up um, in the next couple of weeks, just reading a little bit together. So I'm going to also put it under the document camera so it doesn't really have a bunch of pictures in it. Um, hopefully there's, I think there was a few as we go along. But you can read along with me on the screen or just sit back and listen. But with the book in the way, then you don't always have to look right at me. So sharing the screen with tales of a fourth grade nothing. So other books by Judy Bloom that you guys might have read, Pain in the Great One, The One in the Middle is the Green Kangaroo, Freckle Juice. Um, this book is about Peter and his little brother Fudge. And there's a lot of Fudge books. This one, otherwise known as She's the Great, Super Fudge, Fudge Mania, Double Fudge, Blubber, Iggy's House. There's all kinds of Judy Bloom books. So, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. Table of contents, we have 10 chapters. Chapter one, the big winner. I won dribble at Jimmy Fargo's birthday party. All the other guys got to take home goldfish in little plastic bags. I won him because I guessed there were 348 jelly beans in Mrs. Fargo's jar. Really, there were 423, she told us later. Still, my guess was closest. Peter Warren Hatcher is the big winner, Mrs. Fargo announced. At first, I felt bad that I didn't get a goldfish, too. Then Jimmy handed me a glass bowl. Inside, there was some water and three rocks. A tiny green turtle was sleeping on the biggest rock. All the other guys looked at their goldfish. I knew what they were thinking. They wished they could have tiny green turtles, too. I named my turtle Dribble while I was walking home from Jimmy's party. I live at 25 West 68th Street. It's an old apartment building, but it's got one of the best elevators in New York City. There are mirrors all around. You can see yourself from every angle. There's a soft cushioned bench to sit on if you're too tired to stand. The elevator operator's name is Henry Bevelheimer. He lets us call him Henry because Bevelheimer's very hard to say. Our apartment's on the 12th floor, but I don't have to tell Henry. He already knows. He knows everybody in the building. He's that smart. He even knows I'm nine and in fourth grade. I showed him dribble right away. I won him at a birthday party, I said. Henry smiled. Your mother's going to be surprised. Henry was right. My mother was really surprised. Her mouth opened when I said, just look at what I won at Jimmy Fargo's birthday party. I held up my tiny green turtle. I've already named him, Dribble. Isn't that a great name for a turtle? My mother made a face. I don't like the way he smells, she said. What do you mean? I asked. I put my nose right down close to him. I didn't smell anything but turtle. So Dribble smells like a turtle, I thought. Well, he's supposed to, that's what he is. And I'm not gonna take care of him either, my mother added. Of course you're not, I said. He's my turtle and I'm the one who's going to take care of him. You're going to change his water and clean out his bowl and feed him and all of that, she asked. Yes, I said, and even more, I'm going to see to it that he's happy. This time my mother made a funny nose, funny noise, like a groan. I went into my bedroom. I put Dribble on top of my dresser. 
I tried to pet him and tell him he would be happy living with me, but it isn't easy to pet a turtle. They aren't soft and furry and they don't lick you or anything. Still, I had my own, my very own pet at last. Later, when I sat down at the dinner table, my mother said, I smell turtle. Peter, go and scrub your hands. Some people might think that my mother is my biggest problem. She doesn't like turtles and she's always telling me to scrub my hands. That doesn't mean just run them underwater. Scrub means I'm supposed to use soap and rub my hands together. Then I've got to rinse and dry them. I ought to know by now, I've heard it enough. But my mother isn't my biggest problem. Neither is my father. He spends a lot of time watching commercials on TV. That's because he's in the advertising business. These days, his favorite commercial is the one about Juicio. He wrote it himself. And the president of the Juicio company liked it so much, he sent my father a whole crate of Juicio for our family to drink. It tastes like a combination of oranges, pineapples, grapefruits, pears, and bananas. And if you want to know the truth, I'm getting pretty sick of drinking it. But Juicio isn't my biggest problem either. My biggest problem is my brother, Farley Drexel Hatcher. He's two and a half years old. Everybody calls him Fudge. I feel sorry for him if he's going to grow up with a name like Fudge, but I don't say a word. It's none of my business. Fudge is always in my way. He messes up everything he sees, and when he gets mad, he throws himself flat on the floor and he screams, and he kicks, and he bangs his fist. The only time I really like him is when he's sleeping. He sucks four fingers on his left hand and makes a slurping noise. When Fudge saw Dribble, he said, ooh, see? And I said, that's my turtle, get it? Mine, you don't touch him. Fudge said, no touch, and he laughed like crazy. Chapter two is Mr. and Mrs. Juicio. One night, my father came home from the office all excited. He told, us Mrs. he told us Mr. and Mrs. Yarby were coming to New York. He's the president of the Juicio company. He lives in Chicago. I wondered if he'd bring my father another crate of Juicio. If he did, I'd probably be drinking it for the rest of my life. Just thinking about it was enough to make my stomach hurt. My father said he invented, invited Mr. and Mrs. Yarby to stay with us. My mother wanted to know why they couldn't stay at a hotel like most people who come to New York. My father said they could, but he didn't want them to. He thought they'd be more comfortable staying with us. My mother said that was about the silliest thing she'd ever heard. But she fixed up Fudge's room for our guests. She put fancy sheets and a brand new blanket on the hide -a bed That's a sofa that opens up into a bed at night. It's in Fudge's room because that used to be our den. Before he was born, we watched TV in there. And lots of times, Grandma slept over on this hide -a bed Now we watch TV right in the living room, and Grandma doesn't sleep over very often. My mother mo moved Fudge's crib into my room. He's going to get a regular bed when he's three, my mother said. There are a lot of reasons I don't like to sleep in the same room as Fudge. I find, found out that two months ago when my room was being painted. I had to sleep in Fudge's room for three nights because the paint smell made me cough. For one thing, he talks in his sleep. And if a person didn't know better, the person could get scared. Another thing is that slurping noise he makes. It's true that I like to hear it when I'm awake, but when I'm trying to fall asleep, I like things very quiet. When I complained about having to sleep with, with Fudge, my mother said, it's just for two nights, Peter. I'll sleep in the living room, I suggested, on the sofa or even a chair. No, my mother said, you will sleep in your bedroom, in your own bed. There was no point in arguing. Mom wasn't going to change her mind. She spent the day in the kitchen. She really cooked up a storm. She used so many pots and pans, Fudge didn't have any left to bang together. And that's one of his favorite pastimes, banging pots and pans together. A person can get an awful headache listening to that racket. Right after lunch, my mother opened up the, di the dinner table. We don't have a separate dining room. When we have company for dinner, we eat in one end of the living room. When mom finished setting the table, she put a silver bowl filled with flowers right in the middle. I said, hey mom, it looks like you're expecting the president or something. Very funny, Peter, my mother answered. Sometimes my mother laughs like crazy at my jokes. Other times she pretends not to get them. And then there are times when I know she gets them, but she doesn't seem to like them. This was one of those times. So I decided no more jokes until after dinner. 
I went to Jimmy Fargo's for the afternoon. I came home at four o'clock. I found my mother standing over the dinner table mumbling. Fudge was on the floor playing with my father's socks. I'm not sure why he likes socks so much, but if you give him a few pairs, he'll play quietly for an hour. I said, hi, mom, I'm home. I'm missing two flowers, my mother said. I don't know how she noticed that two flowers were missing from the silver bowl because there were at least a dozen of them left. But sure enough, when I checked, I saw two stems with nothing on them. Don't look at me, mom, I said. What would I do with two measly flowers? So we both looked at Fudge. Did you take mommy's pretty flowers? My mother asked him. No take, Fudge said. He was chewing on something. What's in your mouth? My mother asked. Fudge didn't answer. Show mommy. No show, Fudge said. Oh yes. My mother picked him up and forced his mouth open. She fished out a rose petal. What did you do with mommy's flowers? She raised her voice. She was really getting upset. Fudge laughed. Tell mommy. Yum, Fudge said. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Oh no, my mother cried, rushing to the telephone. She called Dr. Cohn. She told him that Fudge ate two flowers. Dr. Cohn must have asked what kind, because my mother said roses, I think, but I can't be sure. One might have been a daisy. There was a long pause while my mother listened to whatever Dr. Cohn had to say. Then mom said, thank you, Dr. Cohn. She hung up. No more flowers, she told Fudge. You understand? No more, Fudge repeated. No more, no more, no more. My mother gave him a spoonful of peppermint flavored medicine, the kind I take when I have stomach pains. Then she carried Fudge off to have his bath. Leave it to my brother to eat flowers. I wondered how they tasted. Maybe they're delicious and I don't know it because I've never tasted one, I thought. I decided to find out. I picked off one petal from a pink rose. I put it in my mouth and tried to chew it up, but I couldn't do it. It tasted awful. I spit it out in the garbage. Well, at least now I knew I wasn't missing something great. Fudge ate his supper in the kitchen before our company arrived. While I was eating, I heard my mother remind him, Fudgy's going to be a good boy tonight. Very good for daddy's friends. Good, Fudge said, good boy. That's right, my mother told him. I changed and scrubbed up while Fudge finished his supper. I was going to eat with the company. Being nine has its advantages. My mother was all dressed up by the time my father got home with the Yarbies. You'd never have guessed that mom spent most of the day in the kitchen. You'd also never have guessed that Fudge ate two flowers. He was feeling fine. He even smelled nice, like baby powder. Mrs. Yarby picked him up right away. I knew she would. She looked like a grandmother. That type always makes a big deal out of Fudge. She walked into the living room, cuddling him. Then she sat down on the sofa and bounced Fudge around on her lap. Isn't he the cutest little boy, Mrs. Yarby said. I just love babies. She gave him a big kiss on the top of his head. I kept waiting for somebody to tell her Fudge was no baby, but no one did. My father carried the Yarby's suitcases into Fudge's room. When he came back, he introduced me to our company. This is our older son, Peter, he said to the Yarby's. I'm nine and in fourth grade, I told them. How do, Peter, Mr. Yarby said. Mrs. Yarby just gave me a nod. She was still busy with fudge. I have a surprise for this dear little boy, she said. It's in my suitcase. Should I go get it? Yes, fudge shouted. Go get, go get. Mrs. Yarby laughed as if that was the best joke she had ever heard. I'll be right back, she told fudge. She put him down and ran off to find her suitcase. She came back carrying a present tied up with a red ribbon. Ooh, Fudge cried, opening his eyes wide. Goody! He clapped his hands. Mrs. Yarby helped him unwrap his surprise. It was a wind-up train that made a lot of noise. Every time it bumped into something, it turned around and went the other way. Fudge liked it a lot. He likes anything that's noisy. I said, that's a nice train. Mrs. Yarby turned to me. Oh, I have something for you too. Uh, um, Peter, I reminded her. My name is Peter. Yes, well, I'll go get it. Mrs. Yarby left the room again. This time she came back with a flat package. It was wrapped up too, red ribbon and all. She handed it to me. Fudge stopped playing with his train long enough to come over and see what I got. 
I took off the paper very carefully in case my mother wanted to save it, and also to show Mrs. Yarby that I'm a lot more careful about things than my brother. I'm not sure she noticed. My present turned out to be a big picture dictionary, the kind I liked when I was about four years old. My old one is in Fudge's bookcase now. I don't know much about big boys, Mrs. Yarby said, so the lady in the store said a nice book would be a good idea. A nice book would have been a good idea, I thought, but a picture dictionary? That's for babies. I've had my own regular dictionary since I was eight, but I knew I had to be polite, so I said, thank you very much. It's just what I've always wanted. Oh, I'm so glad, Mrs. Yarby said. She let out a long sigh and sat back on the sofa. My father offered the Yarbys a drink. Good idea, good idea, Mr. Yarby said. What'll it be, my father asked. What'll it be, Mr. Yarby repeated, laughing. What do you think, Hatcher? It'll be juicio. That's all we ever drink. Good for your health, Mr. Yarby pounded his chest. Of course, my father said, like he knew it all along. Juicio for everyone, my father told my mother. She went into the kitchen to get it. While my father and Mr. Yarby were discussing juicio, fudge just disappeared. Just as my mother served everyone a glass of Mr. Yarby's favorite drink, he came back. He was carrying a book, my old worn out picture dictionary, the same as the one the Yarbys just gave me. See, fudge said, climbing up on Mrs. Yarby's lap, see book. I wanted to vanish. I think my mother and father did too. See book, now fudge held it up over his head. I can use another one, I explained. I really can. That old one is falling apart, I tried to laugh. It's returnable, Mrs. Yarby said. It's silly to keep it if you already have one. She sounded insulted, like it was my fault she brought me something I already had. Mine, Fudge said. He closed the book and held it tight against his chest. Mine, mine, mine. It's the thought that counts, my mother said. It was so nice of you to think of our boys. Then she turned to Fudge. Put the book away now, Fudgy. Isn't it Fudgy's bedtime, my father hinted. Oh yes, I think it is, my mother said, scooping him up. Say good night, Fudgy. Good night, Fudgy, my brother said, waving at us. Fudge was supposed to fall asleep before we sat down to dinner, but just in case, my mother put a million little toys in his crib to keep him busy. I don't know who my mother thought she was fooling, because we all know that Fudge can climb out of his crib any old time he wants to. He stayed away until we were in the middle of our roast beef. Then he came in carrying Dribble's bowl. He walked right up to Mrs. Yarby. He thought she was his new friend. See, he said, holding Dribble under her nose. See, Dribble? Mrs. Yarby shrieked, Oh, I can't stand reptiles. Get that thing away from me. Fudge looked disappointed. He showed Dribble to Mr. Yarby. See, he said. Hatcher, Mr. Yarby boomed. Make him get that thing out of here. I wondered why Mr. Yarby called my, friend, my father Hatcher. Didn't he know his first name was Warren? And I didn't like the way Mr. and Mrs. Yarby both called Dribble a thing. I jumped up. Give him to me, I told Fudge. I took Dribble and his bowl and marched into my room. I inspected my turtle all over. He seemed all right. I didn't want to make a big scene in front of our company, but I was mad. I mean, really mad. That kid knows he's not allowed to touch my turtle. Peter, my father called, come and finish your dinner. When I got back to the table, I heard Mrs. Yarby say, it must be interesting to have children. We never had any ourselves. But if we did, Mr. Yarby told my father, we'd teach them some manners. I'm a firm believer in old fashioned good manners. So are we, Howard, my father said in a weak voice. I thought Mr. Yarby had a lot of nerve to hint that we had no manners. Didn't I pretend to like their dumb old picture dictionary? If that isn't good manners, then I don't know what is. My mother excused herself and carried Fudge back to my room. I guess she put him into his crib again. I hope she told him to keep his hands off my things. We didn't hear from him again until dessert. Just as my mother was pouring the coffee, he ran in wearing my rubber gorilla mask from last Halloween. It was a very real looking mask. I guess that's why Mrs. Yarby screamed so loud. If she hadn't made so much noise, my mother probably wouldn't have spilled the coffee all over the floor. My father grabbed Fudge and pulled the gorilla mask off of him. That's not funny, Fudge, he said. Funny, Fudge laughed. Funny, 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 Fudgy. 
Yes, sir, Hatcher, Mr. Yarby said, old fashioned manners. By that time, I'm sure my father was sorry the Yarbys weren't staying at a hotel. I finally got to bed at 10. Fudge was in his crib, slurping away. I thought I'd never fall asleep, but I guess I did. I woke up once when Fudge started babbling. He said, boo ba ma 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 ba ba she Whatever that means. I didn't even get scared. I whispered, shut up, and he did. Early the next morning, I felt something funny on my arm. At first, I didn't wake up. I just felt this little tickle. I thought it was part of my dream, but then I had the feeling somebody was staring at me, so I opened my eyes. Fudge was standing over me, and Dribble was crawling around on my arm. I guess Fudge could tell I was about ready to kill him because he bent down and kissed me. That's what he does when my mother's angry at him. He thinks nobody can resist him when he makes himself so lovable. And a lot of times it works with my mother, but not with me. I jumped up, put Dribble back into his bowl, and smacked Fudge on his backside hard. He hollered. My father came running into my room. He was still in his pajamas. He whispered, what's going on in here? I pointed at Fudge and he pointed at me. He picked up my brother and carried him off. Go back to sleep, Peter, he said. It's only six o'clock in the morning. I fell asleep for another hour, then woke up to an awful noise. It was Fudge playing with his new train. It woke up everybody, including the Arby's. But this time there was nobody they could blame. They were the ones who gave Fudge the train in the first place. Breakfast was a very quiet affair. Nobody had much to say. Mr. Yarby drank two glasses of Juicio. Then he told my father that he and Mrs. Yarby had their suitcase packed. They were leaving for a hotel as soon as breakfast was over. My father said he understood that the apartment was too small for so many people. My mother didn't say anything. When Mr. Yarby went into Fudge's bedroom to pick up his suitcase, his voice boomed, Hatcher! My father ran toward the bedroom. My mother and Mrs. Yarby followed him. I followed them. When we got there, we saw Fudge sitting on the Yarby's suitcase. He had decorated it with about 100 green stamps, the kind my mother gets at the supermarket. See, Fudge said, see, pretty. He laughed. Nobody else did. Then he licked the last green stamp and stuck it right in the middle of the suitcase. All gone, Fudge sang, holding up his hands. It took my mother half an hour to peel off her trading stamps and clean up the Yarby suitcase. All right, so we're going to stop before I finish the rest of this to let you know, to talk to you about green stamps. So in the olden days, when you went grocery shopping, you would get a green stamp and it looked like a stamp and it was a green paper. Um, you would get like one for every dollar that you of groceries, money that you spent on groceries. And you collected your green stamps in a booklet that it was kind of a liquid paste or glue down situation. And when you filled up a book, you would go to a special green stamp store and you could trade in your books of stamps for things. Sometimes they were little things, sometimes they're bigger things. You could get a, like a toaster or a coffee pot. Um, my, when I was littler, my grandma would save her green stamps and then let us take them to the store. And she was my teacher grandma. So we actually bought her one of those brass apple bells with her green stamps and we bought it for her for her birthday or, or something like that. Um, and I have it now as a, as a memory of her. Um, so that's where the green stamps come from. So, you know, sometimes now like at Safeway, they have the McDonald's um, gift card to little token things that they have that McDonald's or the Monopoly game. So every dollar you spend, you get a certain amount of cards. It's kind of like that situation. So for every money, amount of money that you spent, you would get a stamp, you would stick them into a book and save your books and take them to trade them in for things that maybe you could use or maybe fun things that you could give as presents to people. The next week, my father came home from the office and collected all the cans of Juicio in our house. He dumped them into the garbage. My mother felt bad that my father had lost such an important account, but my father told her not to worry. Juicio wasn't selling very well at the stores. Nobody seemed to like the combination of oranges, grapefruits, pineapples, pears, and bananas. You know, Dad, I said, I only drank Juicio to be polite. I really hated it. You know something funny, Peter? My father said. I thought it was pretty bad myself. All right, so we're going to stop right there. So next time that we get together, I will start with chapter three, the family dog. 
and we will continue reading. So the science connection that we're going to be making um, has something to do with the fact that Peter is nine, his brother Fudge is two and a half, and Fudge is pretty much just a pain, and he's always getting into stuff. And I can't wait to read the story because some of the things that they get in, he gets into are just crazy. So that relationship between the two brothers is going to need, um, we have some problem solving to do and there's going to need some solutions and you guys are going to be thinking up some of those solutions. So um, until I see you again, next time we'll start at chapter three. Talk to you later, friends.